this problem session a little bit. I was continuing this problem session, but then I thought that this was not getting recorded. So my bad. And um, well, it's already 7.38, so we have lost half an hour, but I'll go back and I'll kind of um, repeat the same things kind of in a very short way. So basically, this is problem session number three, which is going to help you uh, revise. So what is the revision for? This is the revision for exam one, which is on the 29th. And 29th date is kind of a little bit conflicting for you because you also might have an EMAG exam at the same day. We consider the different possibilities. Unfortunately, we cannot uh, postpone this date any further because we have a lot of other coverage materials. So unfortunately, you have to have the problem uh, of giving two exams in one day for those of you who are taking EMAG and taking uh, probability at the same time. So um, a little bit more. So let me actually introduce another slide so that I can talk about this. So there were a couple of announcements that we were going through, and since I forgot to record it, I'm going to actually kind of give you those uh, things again. So this is your problem session three. The coverage of this problem session is basically to help you with your homework three, which is again not required for you to submit, but it's good if you try to actually work out those problems. The solutions will be uploaded tomorrow so that you can actually work it out, but you are not required to actually submit it. And this will not be counted into your grades when you are um, finally trying to actually calculate all your grades because of the less time that we have. So uh, for problem session number three, again, I am your GTA Eileen and I am a fourth year PhD student. For those of you who do not know my office hours, it's basically Monday to Friday from 10 to 11 p.m. Uh, and 11 to 12 p.m. The 10 to 11 p.m. is basically when I have my HKN tutoring hours and the 11 to 12 p.m. is when I have my GTA hours. So basically you have two hours of me every single day. And despite the fact that there are so much of um, problem sessions and so much of uh, uh, GTA hours that I give, there are students who cannot attend that specific hours because they have other labs on other conflicting activities. You can actually contact me anytime um, via an email or you want to set an appointment with me on Teams. I'm open to all possibilities. OK, just to let you know. So um, I'm going to actually just give some quick announcements. So the coverage of this particular exam one. So the exam one is on 29th, first of all. All right, so exam one, 29th. And um, we are not changing this. This is final. So the coverage is uh, actually, if you see the last lecture, uh, that is on the Thursday. I took a little bit of a problem session before that, and I was trying to actually describe or kind of try to go through a Poisson's random variable. But then after that, actually, if you continue watching the lecture, you will see that every possible coverage is still 147. Now this does not cover Gaussian, OK? So Gaussian random variable is a very, very important random variable, and a Gaussian random variable is actually not a material of exam one. Gaussian, I'm going to take another problem session just on Gaussian random variable because it's extremely important. And there are other types of random variables. Probably you will come across like Raptation or um, Cauchy random variable or Rayleigh random variable, Pareto random variable. So these random variables are also not very important, at least from the sake of um, exam, exam point of view. But they, if you if you go through them, they are pretty much just formula based, just like Gaussian random variable. They have a specific formula. Their distribution looks in, in a certain way and they'll have a certain expected value and variance. So it's just that um, sometimes you, especially for example, in communication system, if you actually uh, go on to take your wireless communication classes or even if some of you are actually uh, taking telecom, we are going to take up Gaussian and say, for example, very random variable or Russian random variable. Uh, you will have those distributions kind of explained again. So I'm going to actually touch base a little bit on those uh, just for the sake of uh, some of you who are going to take up telecom in the future, but this is not a scope of this exam. OK, uh, so what what are what what all are included in this exam is basically everything that we have covered in conditional probability. OK, conditional probability, uh, this is like a comma. Okay. Uh, Bayes rule, 
or Bayes theorem, whichever way you actually say it. So Bayes rule, uh, Bayes theorem is there. And after that, we covered a little bit of binomial. After that, we covered geometric. Then we covered um, Poissons, and we are going to do more problem on Poissons because I realized that I haven't done enough. So these are basically you can take them as uh, random variables or the specific distribution. So binomial probability law, geometric probability law, or binomial random variable, geometric random variable that actually kind of follows those laws. So I'm just going to use the word random variable, but please know that these are basically the same as those distribution laws. Uh, Poissons and then um, Basically, we also talked about exponential, but from the exam point of view, if exponential is important, I'll let you know tomorrow. But the point is that uh, conditional base rule, binomial, geometric, Poisson's, then you go into the concepts of CDF. But before you go on to the concepts of CDF, we are going to do PMF, right? So, so that, and then we are going to consider PDF, right? And then we are going to consider expected value because you need to know how to calculate the mean or expected value. And then we are going to go into the concepts of variance. So all these are basically supposed to be a part of your exam one. So a lot of material to cover today, so I'm going to actually cover it a little bit faster. So um, first of all, let's start with the concepts of PMF. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually. Um, hang on. Yes. Uh, Stop my video so that I can actually start sharing my screen properly. Because I'm so I kind of do a lot of writing, so sometimes the video jitters. So anyway, so we were revising um, and for those of you who follow the book again, let me actually give you the page numbers that I'm kind of trying to revise it from. So we are trying to actually first cover the definitions of PMF. OK. And then we are going to go on to CDF and then we are going to go on to PDF. OK, so the PMF basically. Why we are revising these things is because uh, for your discrete random variables, which is your uh, geometric, your binomial, uh, Poisson's, these are all your discrete random cases. So PMF will be for the discrete random cases. Um, so let me write discrete and. Uh, Professor has actually made a very important table. If you again follow through this lecture, you'll have like a very specific table form format kind of going on where you have the comparison between discrete and continuous. Please go and see that table so that you can actually get a summarized view of what type of differences exist between the expected value or the variance of or the PMF and the distribution of a discrete case and then a continuous case. But we are going to basically generally describe the uh, the structure of the PMF or what it means to be a PMF or to study a PMF or whatever. So the probability mass function is basically for a discrete random variable and it's written mathematical notation of that. OK. Uh, mathematically, it's written as small p capital X of small x. How is it read? Px of x. Now this X is basically a capital X, okay? Bold capital X. That means that this is the random variable. So we are trying to actually basically find the probability of that specific value. So capital X is equal to that specific value. What is the probability of that, right? We are, that's all. So now uh, for a discrete case, that's all it's it, that that's all it is. So basically for any finite range that we have and I mean sometimes it can be actually also like this. Some scientists subscripted. Because. Um, you can write for all K or sometimes it's also written as K is equal to one, two, three like that. So basically what I'm trying to actually point out is that the X is basically a discrete kind of case. That is why I have kind of given the subscript K. That is X1, X2, X3, like that. So this is for a discrete case, and this obviously has some properties and why we are trying to actually solve all these things and um, 
what is the significance of it? We are going to go through the various problems so that um, uh, we can understand it better. So the properties of the PMF, first of all, is if this should be obviously for all X greater than zero, OK? For all X, OK? That's the first property. What is the second property? The second property is that if you sum all your PMF, OK? So um, sometimes it's written like this, all K. And what does all K really mean? Px, that is the probability of that. Oops. OK, if you take the summation of all your PMFs, that turns out to one. The other property, so these are the two properties that will be actually required for you to solve the problems. That is there in the exercise three or homework three or assignment three. So this is for a discrete case again. Just try to remember these two properties and we'll come back to these two properties when we solve numerical problems. But for now, just for the sake of time, we are going to move on to actual um, CDF. And um, I am kind of discussing from chapter. So this was chapter three material, OK? This is chapter three, OK? Now. Coming down to chapter four, um, you have the concept of probability district um, PDF and CDF. So, what is PDF and what is CDF? First, let us discuss CDF. Okay. So, first we are discussing CDF. This is called cumulative distribution function, and this is kind of for continuous cases. Now, you can use CDF to both describe a discrete random variable as well as a continuous random variable, but PMF is only for discrete cases. So, but anyway, the CDF is basically. Uh, again, the definition is written as so it's how is it written? Capital FX of small x. So it's kind of similar notation to this is just small p though. So it's similar notation as the PMF though, but the definition of this is a little bit different. It basically follows a range. So X less than equal to some small X. Now. Um, basically what this means is that. Um, it's well, I don't want to put it this way, but CDF is basically a convenient way of specifying the probabilities of a specific interval in a specific real line. What does that mean though? Well, we are actually going to see the properties and then we are going to find out that this is basically a distribution, right? So if you find out this distribution of that specific random variable, you will also find that this also follows some properties. So fx of x, as you can see out here, lies within a very specific range. Okay, the second property is that it's very similar to uh, your PMF, but now we have a range of values instead of some certain values. Um, as you climb up in the PDF, sorry, in the CDF, so if you go from the small x, small x, remember, is a number. So this number is going towards infinity. OK, so what what how would this CDF um, behave in that sense? This is going to go basically towards one. Similarly, if this number, if just a number going towards minus infinity, this basic value is going to go towards zero. So you can see that this concludes that this is basically a non-decreasing function. It starts from zero, or maybe it, it, it goes from the zero all the way up to the value of one. So this is basically a non-decreasing function. And there are other three important properties. So I'm going to actually star mark this, which is important from the perspective of your numerical problems. What are these? Um, there are many properties in your book, but I kind of tend to again summarize my um, properties based on the problems that I'm going to solve. So this is a value of A and B. So this random variable lies between this specific range. How do you find out the CDF of this specific guy? You just take the CDF of that specific point. 
and then subtract it from the CDF of the lower limits. That's how easy it is. OK, and specifically number four. Um, or this is not the fourth property, though, in, that is according to your book, but I'm just going according to my problem solving um, techniques. So the third property and the fourth property is kind of important. So sometimes you will find find X greater than five. So, well, you can actually turn it up, upside like inside out or upside down by just taking it one and then subtracting it one. Why? Because PDF. Uh, sorry, CDF cannot be greater than one. So one minus of X of. Less than that value. So basically what I'm trying to say is that if there is a graph and if something is out here, I mean, I'm drawing a Gaussian because that's my favorite type, type of PDF, but need not be Gaussian. So the, say suppose this is five, OK? And you are told to find out what is the problem. Uh, you're told to find out. I'm just giving you an example again. This is just random example. OK. So X greater than five. So what I'm going to do is instead I'm going to take all these all these ranges between the graph. So I'm going to take in one minus P of X less than five. And then try to find this out. So because the area under this entire curve is basically one. So that's why. Um, so that being said, let us go actually and try and solve some problems. And this is. Oh, no, I'll keep it and um, I'm going to try and solve some problems from the second slide. So this particular problem session has been uploaded already in your assignment sections. Uh, this is nothing for you to do. This is just for um, you to practice if you want to. So we are going to practice some problems on PMF and then slowly try and uh, get our way towards the CDF. Then when we come back, we are going to actually try and discuss more problems on uh, PDF and a little bit of your homework problems as well so that you can get started. All right, so um, the problems that you see in this slides have been like this. These are the problems that have collected over some time because they kind of try and get our concepts of PMF or CDF or PDF or whichever topics we are trying to discuss kind of more clear. So these are not essentially the problems that you would get on. You might get in the um, exam, but this is nothing that you are going to see in ever in your problem sets that you get. That is for your homeworks because these are problems that are different from your book. So um, the problem the, it does not specify that this is a PMF or a PDF or whatever it is. It just tells us that a uh, department of statistics has a lab with six computers reserved for uh, statistics majors. X denotes the number of computers that are in use and uh, there is a specific time of the day and there is a specific number of computers that are getting used and we see just a probability distribution of X. So now we can clearly see that this is a discrete case. Why? Because 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 is discrete numbers. We are not considering all the possible values between 0 and 1, 1 and 2, 2 and 3. So these are discrete random variable. So that is how you actually differentiate discrete from continuous random variable. There is also a specific problem in your problem set. I think the last problem, which is mixed random variable, which is like discrete plus continuous. So there can be three types of random variables. One is discrete, one is continuous, one is mixed. So this is more of like mixed. OK, so now what we are trying to find out the question. So these are all your information. This is what you have. What do you need? The probability that at most two computers are used. Now remember uh, when I began probability discussion, I said that some words are very, very important. So this word at most and this word at least is going to be quite important for you. At most means. Maximum. You cannot have more than this, right? So at most two computers are getting used means maximum two computers are getting used, not more than that. So well, if two computers are supposed to be used, you can use zero computers and you can use one computers or you can use two computers. At most means at maximum. So what I'm trying to say is that you can have X less than two. 
but the equal to part you have to add y because x can be no computers x can be one computer x can be two computers because you cannot go beyond two that's the point so two is included that is why p of x is basically less than and equal to two that's the point so you can see that we have to take the case of zero one and two well, 0, 1 and 2 have very, very specific uh, probabilities already, so we just add them up because it's 0 or 1 or 2. Remember, sometimes um, some problem sessions back, I said that if it's an or, you need to add those cases up, and that's why we add them up, and this is your specific um, probability for at most. Similarly, at least. Now, at least means what? At least means minimum, right? So at least three computers, or you can read this problem as minimum of three or more computers, right? So three or more computers are getting used. Now you can do it in three ways though. Uh, you can actually try adding up these probabilities, but a safer way of doing it is, you already know this one, right? So you just can subtract it from one and just get this value. But if in case you are curious, you can add this guy, 0 0.25 plus 0 0.20 that means 0 0.45 plus again 10 is 55 plus 10 is 60 and then plus 10 is 70. This is going to give you the same results right so what I did was I added this guy plus this guy plus this guy plus this guy that is also going to give you the same result that is 0 0.70 but since I already have this calculated, I try to use this out here and try to make my life easier. So PMF, as you can see, has for certain value, there are certain points. So if you plot it, uh, I'm sure I have some plots out here for. Yeah, so if you plot it, basically it will look like this discrete cases. OK. Um, OK, we are going to actually reach that problem set. So let's do another problem, though. So that we can wrap our head around the PMF thing. Six lots of computers are ready to be shipped for a certain supplier. The number of defective components for each of these are shown. So what, we, what are we trying to do though? We are trying to learn that for each discrete cases, there are discrete set of values that are there. OK, so all the discrete set of values. Now remember this expression. How did that come? All right. So remember this expression, OK? So remember when we defined PMF, we said X equal to some small X. So this small X is basically this value, if you recall. Right? We said uh, we, we gave the expression of P. Cap I don't know why this is doing this, though. Let me see. OK, yes, uh, P capital X of small x. We defined it like this and then we said capital X is equal to X. That means what P of zero. So capital X is equal to zero. What does capital X equals to zero mean? Zero can be at one, can be at three and can be at six, right? So one or three or six. And what is OK? Th that's that's great. But what do we do now? One of these lots can be randomly selected for shipments to a particular customer. Let X be the number of defectives in the selected lot. So there are defectives in these lots. The three possible X values are 0, 1, and 2. So it can be either non-defective, one defective, two defective. Of the six equally simple events, the result is X equals 0, 1 in X equals 1, and 2 in X equals 2. So basically what we are trying to find out that for X is equal to 0, and for X is equal to one and for X is equal to two, we are trying to find out the PDFs, right? So this is equiprobable, remember that. So equiprobable means it can happen this, 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 or this, like that. So three out of the six possible combinations will have no defects. Again, if you want to find out one defect, one defect can only happen in one possibility, that is for four. If the lot four is sent, it's got to be one by six. Why? Because these are equal probable events. That's what it said in the problem. One of these lots are randomly selected for shipment, and the three possible values are zero, one, and two of the six equally likely simple events. 
this particular keyword is basically equally likely or equally probable equally likely so equally likely or equally probable events means that all the probabilities are basically the same for all the options so it's one by six though so that's that's what's represented out here so and the probability of two can be only in two ways it's either two or five so again two out of the six possibilities that is why we have this probability so the pmf the idea is that it has to be at that specific value though and at that specific value you can have multiple uh, options in, in in your in your graph or in your um, for here at least three or at most three well for at least three you need to have anything so what if it was at most three it would have been p of x less than or equal to three right so at most is this guy and at least is this guy right so similarly it's basically discrete so that's what that's what I'm trying to show. And this is basically uh, the value at that specific, the probability of that value at that specific point that is basically one by six or that is basically two by six, whichever way it is. Um, this is again another problem. Uh, I'm not going to go through this problem. It's the same basically. Just go through the problem if you're interested and uh, let me know if you have any problems. We are actually going to act uh, go and see the visual representation like we saw um, earlier that for every discrete value. So this is one value. This is one value. This is one value. We have certain amounts of weight distributions for it. 0 0.4, 0 0.3, 0 0.2, 0 0.1. So we have tried to plot it down and we see that for this is basically the distribution of this specific PMF in line graph. So this is not continuous. You cannot actually draw a line between all these things, right? Um, this is again probably another small example. Let's see. Oh, we have CDF, right? OK, so basically this is PMF. PMF, just remember that this is for discrete cases and um, it's represented as P of X is equal to small x. That means the value at that specific point. All right, uh, we'll move on to CDF. Now CDF, remember, is for continuous cases, OK? So let's read the problem and find out uh, how we are going to do and what we are given. So a store carries a flash drive with either a 1 GB, 2 GB, 4 GB, 8 GB, and 16 GB memory, and the accompanying table is given out here. Now remember that you can use CDF for discrete cases as well. You can use CDF for continuous cases as well. So don't come crying that this is not a continuous random variable, hence we cannot use CDF. No, 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 no. You can use CDF to solve the problem as well. That's the beauty of CDF actually. So again, very, very similar to the PMF case. It's just that I'm trying to show you that CDF can also be used for discrete cases. It's basically the same. If you say X less than or equal to one, it means that for that specific value, you cannot have anything less than, right? So the properties, remember, uh, we, we did property number one, which is in, let me see your page number. Uh, page number 144, we did the property that fx of x should lie between zero and one. So anything less than uh, one, again, out, is, out here is not defined. So we have to take the value of y is equal to one at that specific point. So that is P of one, which is the PMF basically. So P of one is what? 0 0.05. And that is why we write it out here. Oh, man. That is why we write it out here, okay? So again, F of two. Now F of two is basically, it can be F of two or it can be F of one, both, right? So for y equals one or two, because now we have to include everything that is in two and everything that is in one, because both of the distributions are there. So that is why p of one and p of two are basically getting added though. So similarly, four is means uh, one, two, and four. So all of the three are getting added. Similarly, eight and similarly, 16. So now for any other number of y, f y of y will equal the values of x at the closest possibility of y. Now this is very, very important. Because 
you may ask, well, this is CDF, right? So what about if I give you anything, any, any other values which are basically like not a discrete value or not a whole number? Let's let's consider not a real, not a whole number. So what about 2.7? So it lies between two and four, right? Somewhere between two and four. So if I consider this as three, this value, excuse me, this value should be somewhere out here, right? So 2.7, what, what, so how, how do you interpret that though? So, well, you have to read this specific statement. Let me take my highlighter. So now for any other number Y, okay, just a number Y, F Y of Y will equal the value of F at the closest possible value of Y to the left of Y. So what does that mean though? So this, this is 2.7, right? So this is going to represent anything left to that number that is two. So basically 2.7 can be rounded off to two and F of two we already know is 0.15 that we have calculated out here. 7.999, so 7.999 is very close to eight, right? But again, you have to approximate it to something left of that value. So that is why we have taken P of Y less than equal to four. That is why f of 4. So f of 4 we have already found out out here is 0 0.50 and just you put the value in. So remember, if there is a number with, with, within that specific range, which is not defined there, you have to take the left of that. That's the that's the basic idea. OK. Um, just take the pointer. All right, let's move on though. So now you're trying to actually, you have P, uh, F of 1, F of 2, 4, 8, and 16, and now you're trying to find out the plot. So this is this is kind of important though, because sometimes in the exam for very simple problems like this, we are going to try and find out the structure of the PDF. Now, when you're trying to find out the diagram or the graph of the PDF, sometimes if it's a parabolic function, you might get confused though, but this is a step function and how do you find it out though? So we'll go slow out here, okay? First, let us find out f of 1, 2, 4, 8, and 16. How is it represented? So, well, um, when is f of, so this can be written as f of x, okay? Um, not, I mean, not necessarily f of y, so don't, don't get confused when another variable is used out here. It's just a number. So again, if you if you change that to X, all the limits will be changing to X, okay? So in your book, it's defined by X. So if you see a Y, don't get confused, it's just a number. So these are all X's if you define it by X. This is also X, okay? Basically what I'm trying to understand or make you understand is that uh, for F of one, we have, so this goes in a range. So if Y or X, whichever way you take it, so if this X is basically less than Y, uh, less than one, then anything beyond that is basically zero, right? Why? Because that's not defined though, right? So anything beyond X less than one is zero. What about one to two? Let's go back. So everything that is between one and two. So I'm talking about this specific value and this specific value, right? So anything that is within that specific range is 0 0.05. Why did why did we have it 0 0.05? Well, we have to actually, where's my pointer? Okay, so for this specific specific value, until we reach this point though, anything, anything in that specific range will fall back to the left of that value. Remember that? Remember this condition that we have? So we have to actually consider one in this particular stage. So anything that is between one and two will always fall back to one, so 0 0.05. So that is why it's 0 0.05. What about two to four? It is going to fall back to two. And C2 is basically 0 0.15. What about four and eight? It's going to fall back to four. Oops, sorry, that's my bad. So four is what, 0 0.50. See, the value is 0 0.50. Similarly, 8 to 16 fall back to 8. So fall back to 8 means it's 0 0.90. Wait, hang on. What about 16 and up? Remember, the max value is always 1. The main value is always 0. 
because the fx of x or fy of y, whichever way you write it, should be between 0 and 1. That is one of the properties that we did, right? So you have to remember the properties. It will be given at the back of your exam, but you still need to remember how to use those properties in order to come up with these numbers. Now, once you come up with this specific number, uh, you are basically defining this function. So you have found out the function definition. Now you're trying to put it to use in drawing a specific graph. So how do you draw this graph? Well, for zero, for y, excuse me, for y less than one, everything is zero. So for y less than one means what? Uh, you plot your uh, x-axis and y-axis. In your y-axis, you have fx of y, and your x-axis, you have the values y. So you're variating y, and you're trying to find out what type of distribution is this? So when y is equal to 0, so basically y is less than 1, the value is 0. See, this is the value, and this is 0, 0.0. So the moment it reaches 1, though, okay, let me just. So basically, this is 5, 10, 15, 20. So I've taken in the terms of like 5. But the point is, the moment it reaches 1, it kind of jumps. Jumps to which value? 0, 0.05 which is somewhere out here, OK? OK, so this is 0 0.05 and it will continue until it reaches 2. So just imagine that this point is 2. And 2, again, it jumps up to which value? It jumps up to the value of um, whatever is mentioned out here. Yeah, whatever the value out here is, and then it kind of makes another jump to this specific value, whatever the value is out here. Just check the value is 0 0.5. So, so basically you see that this is like a staircase kind of. It goes up here and it, then it stays up here. And then again, at a specific point, it goes up there and it stays up there, right? So the minimum possible value is 0, the maximum possible value is 1. That's how you basically draw a CDF. How to find out the CDF though? You have to find out for each specific point if it's a discrete random variable. For continuous cases, we'll see again why and how, but this is we are discussing discrete cases and what more primarily what we are trying to discuss is that for discrete cases, you can also use CDF as a definition to find out um, the CDF and the uh, PDF later on. Yeah. So this is again another example where the CDF is kind of given and you are trying to find out what are the different values of X equals to X lying between two and five greater than three lying between two and five as well. But this time this is without equal to. So um, this type of problems are also like expected in your exam. Not exactly per se this specific problem. Maybe your PDF you need to kind of calc. So in your exam you might have calculate. Uh, the CDF first of all, or not not calculate. This is uh, actually maybe um, yeah maybe we'll we'll see why, why where we can use it because there are very specific problems in your homework set where you try to use this. So I'm not going to spoil this for you, but basically this problem is also important. Why? Because um, you are trying to calculate the different ranges. This is where you start understanding what the CDF really means. So what it means for our CDF to have X greater than three. So yes, we are defined. We are well defined. The function is well defined in this range as well as this range. So we know exactly when X crosses the value of three, what kind of um, value we are going to expect at that particular point. And we are tra trying to calculate the probability of that. So probability of again, two less than X less than five without the equal to signs. So this problem will clear up. Um, a lot of uh, misconceptions about CDF um, in terms of what are the values at that specific point within that specific range and stuff like that. Um, so for the first part, pretty much it's PMF, right? PMF kind of tells you about X equals small x. So the value at that specific point. So the first calculation is X equals 2. So x equals 2 means what? Now hold up. x equals 2 means you have x equals 2, but there is a there is a big portion or big chunk of definition for anything that is between beyond 
like two, that is means like one to two, zero to one, and then zero. Well, this this case cannot be considered because it's less, it's zero for x less than zero, but these two cases can be considered, right? So when I'm trying to find out x equals to two, that is for that specific point, remember we have to go to the left of it. So I'm trying to find out f of two minus f of one because I only need for x equals two point. So basically what I'm trying to do, whichever type of distribution this is, maybe this is another staircase this, uh, definition. So if I have to find out the value of this specific point, or maybe like this specific point, what I'm trying to do is to find out this point and subtract this point. Because I need the value of that specific point, not the entire range. So that specific point means that point where uh, until where we reached so, minus everything that we have in the left hand side. Right. So that is why we have done F of two minus F of one. That is whatever that value is. Right. Again, greater than can be flipped off and taken as less than. Less than three means one. Again, less than and equal to three means what? So um, F of X less than or equal to three. You have like the cumulative function 0 0.67 there. So the cumulative function at 0 0.67, the value is 0 0.67 though. Now remember that we are not given x equal to. This is less than equal to. If, if, if x was given like. Um, so basically what I'm trying to explain you is that if this was given though. Then we would have exactly done the problem in this way. Or uh, x of 3 minus. So basically we would have done this as f of 3 minus f of 1. Oh, sorry, f of 2. And then we would have gone about solving the problems. But this is greater than 3. Now, obviously, your function is defined greater than 3. And as we have kind of seen earlier, that you can consider this case, this case, and this case. But again, you can flip the problem already and then you already have the value for f of 3 that is 0 0.67 so you just subtract it and you find out the value of x greater than 3. Now uh, similarly for this range similarly for this range now you have to kind of understand that 2 and 5 is having an equal to out here right so f of 5 minus f of 2 And then X. So this particular range or formula, just remember this, that five and anything but. So basically what I'm trying to explain you is I was trying to, let me see if I have that problem or not. Or I specifically have the diagram or not. Let me see. No, I probably do not have that diagram. So as you can see that there are like plenty of examples um, in this um, entire uh, problem set. So yeah, I don't have the diagram, but anyway, what I'm trying to explain you is that. So five, if if I, if I take FX of five again, five minus, but anyway, five then I'm trying to subtract F of that specific point. So anything at that specific point, so five to two, anything at that specific point, anything left of that specific point is basically you have to take the value of left. So mm -hmm. F of five minus F of one. Similarly, anything that is from five, that means again, this range can be considered from two to four. That means F of four minus F of two. So Remember how I'm trying to change the change the quantity because when you have one sided like OK, two, anything greater than two, but then up till what point? Up till what point? Up till the point five. So how, how do I define up till point five? Anything which is less than or equal to four because anything beyond four is again five, but we don't have five as an equal to sign out here. So similarly, uh, for this for this specific case, 
anything that is beyond two, but how do you re represent beyond two? Again, when you have to represent beyond two, remember that it, you have to fall on back to the left of that value. So we are trying to subtract anything in this range. So this is the range that I want, right? Right? Because if it's five and two, this is the range that I want. So I'm trying to subtract everything that is here in the function until the function is defined, like maybe it's at zero. So everything I'm trying to subtract is out here. So how do I represent out here? Barring that point. So that is why f of one. So this is f of all all this region getting subtracted from this specific region. So basically this guy minus this guy is basically this guy. So that is what this problem kind of specifies. We'll do more. We'll do more problems on that to specify the range. And for this guy, what you have is. The range of two. OK, anything beyond two is fine, but what about beyond five? How do you how do you restrict that range? So anything that is up to four and not reaching exactly that limit of five, that is why it's fx of four minus fx of two. Well. Uh, it's kind of confusing at this specific point of time. But we'll move on to our problem sets in the um, homework to actually explain you this better. So for now, we'll leave it and we'll move on to this is again a very important problem. Why this is important is because first of all, this is there in your problem set. So discussing this probably will be very uh, crucial for me uh, because this exactly will be like. So let me show you the. OK. So discussing this will actually kind of eliminate my possibility of discussing that specific problem. Now, for those of you who do not know the mathematics or mathematical formula for summation, uh, this will be given at the back of your exam. So anything that has to do with hardcore mathematics, this is not a math class, so this one will be pre practically given at the back of your exam, but you should know how to use this though, right? So recall that when we started discussing PMF, uh, we started discussing about the possibility of um, a, a property. So what is that property? The property is that if you sum up all the PMF in that specific range, it kind of sums up to one, right? So we have to use that property somehow, but then how do you use it? So we have PX of X and the distribution is given as K by X square. So now I know that if I put this value of k by x square, and if I sum it over all x, what I would get is equal to 1. Now this is a constant. This can actually then stay outside the summation sign. So summation over x of 1 over x square is basically is equal to 1. So you are solving an equation or. Or. Right, so this is an equation, right? So you, now you have to find out the value of K. What do you do? One divided by this expression, this entire summation expression. But wait, hang on. What is this summation expression exactly equal to? Well, according to mathematics, if you solve this summation expression, it will come out to be some values called pi square by six, and this will be given to you. So now what we can find out is that, well, if that is kind of the solution, then K is equal to six by pi square, right? And K is just a constant. So now going back and putting back the value of K in this function, we can write that PX of X is basically equal to. Six by pi square. I'm trying to actually just complete it. One over X square for all X. Actually for all X is a wrong expression, so let's not write that for X equals. 1, 2, dot, 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 and 0 elsewhere. OK, so basically what we are trying to do is. Um, we are trying to find out a constant. This particular problem, it might not come in as like one big chunk of problem, but once you find out the constant, you might uh, also be asked to find out the CDF and PDF or whatever. But the point is that uh, you can find out the constants. You have to just use the properties. Uh, this is similarly 
uh, calculation of the variance and the expected value. We are going to come back to this slide, but just to let you know that the variance and the uh, whichever way you find it out, the expected value or the mean is basically the mean. It's just the mean. Right, so um, here is just a, a normal kind of example of like a weighted mean kind of situation should going on out here for the variance and the mean is just the mean. So uh, you can work this out on your own, I guess. Or if not, I'll come back and we have another problem in the problem set so that we define these uh, this um, expected value and variance. Similarly, we have another example of ex expected value and variance calculation. You have a certain uh, PMF that is given out here. How do you calculate the expected value? How do you calculate the variance? How do you calculate the standard deviation? So this problem can use can be used as a reference. Like this is an extensive kind of problem set where you have typically all types of problems that you can actually get for your exam. So how do you do that? Well, the expected value, as you know, the formula, this is the formula for expected value. In the integration space, you just put integration over all x. Um, this suddenly stopped working. So x, px, dx. Okay, that's for the continuous space. For the discrete space, the integration just gets replaced by the summation. So what do you do? Uh, you literally take the uh, distribution. You multiply it by your uh, x's that you have. So consider this as the points, and this is the weights. Okay. So each of the points is getting multiplied by each of the weights, and then you take the sum of it, and basically that's your expected value. So you can say, hey, wait, hang on. I have done this in like primary classes when you are taking probably your uh, math classes in your high school or whatever, where you are trying to calculate the weighted mean, right? So this is basically some kind of weighted mean, and that's all the expected value is, because expected value, remember, um, well, since we are not running random processes, I can actually safely say this, but it's not always true. So it's also represented by the mean. So it's just the mean. Out here, it's literally the mean. So the variance is basically the formula again is this. Uh, sometimes the formula will be written like X minus mean. Uh, OK, you take the square of that, right? And then you multiply it by the distribution. And now you integrate it or differentiate it de depending on whether it's a continuous random variable or a discrete. For this case, you can actually see that this is discrete. So um, you just take the x's, subtract it from the mean, and square it up, and then just use the distribution and multiply it. So that's exactly what has been done out here. And standard deviation, as you already know, it's just a square root of the variance, and that's your number. All these formula will be given at the back of your paper. It's just that you should know how to use it. That's how easy it is. Um, this is also a fun problem. Uh, this will also help you solve the homework problem. There's one homework, or maybe not. Maybe maybe I'll give it to you in the next problem set. So whichever it is, this is a good problem for you to actually um, uh, touch base your intervals. Find the probability that first four numbers are less than 2.5 and greater than 2.5. Again, less than 2.5 and 4 are greater than 2.5. So how do you do that? You have the solutions for that exactly out here. So you can take a look at that if you want to. Now, as promised, we are going to revise a little bit of the Poisson's distribution. Uh, I kind of uh, started with the PMF because PMF is, again, a part of the a discussion scope of discrete random variable. And as you know, that Poisson's distribution is actually a discrete random variable because if you variate the values, okay, let me take the pointer. If you variate the values of each K, you'll get each discrete cases, right? This is not, not like an integrative case where you have all possible values. Though. So I, as you know, that the expected value is alpha, variance is also alpha, very neat kind of uh, distribution as well. So alpha raised to the power of k, k factorial to the power of minus alpha. And we had done a small problem, or we had started working on a small problem uh, in the previous class, and we are going to continue doing that. This is basically the description, a discrete random variable x is said to have a Poisson's distribution with a parameter of mu, which is greater than zero, always greater than zero. And the PMF of that, or the PDF of that, whichever uh, way it is. Uh, so the PMF of that is kind of given by this. And in continuous cases, you'll have PDF anyway. 
or CDF maybe, who knows? So I'm going to actually take it down to my head and move on to the next slides. So uh, there are various examples again in here. Uh, some of those particular set of examples are very simple. Um, so basically, you have to learn how to use this specific formula though. Now, how do you know it? And how do you interpret it? How do you read the problem? We'll find it out, okay? So let me take a sip of water just. All right, so how do you do it? Suppose you're reading the problem, right? So how do you read the problem? Well, suppose pulses arrive at a counter at an average rate. So you underline the word rate, okay? Now, what is the rate? Six per minute. So six per minute, okay? You write that down. So this is this is itself your rate given. So you don't even need to find out the rate anymore. So the alpha out here is already given to be six. Or, uh, you know, how the formula is like e to the power of minus alpha alpha to the power of k by k factorial. This is the formula, right? I mean, this is just um, a previous slide thing, right? This is the value. So this is the value of x that this x is going to be sitting out here. So what, what you're going to find out is px, capital X, that is the random variable, is going to have that value. So e raised to the power of the rate. OK, this is the rate. So I'm just going to write rate out here just for your sake. Okay, This is the rate into rate. Man, my mouse is at all not moving today. Let me write that again. Sorry about that. So e raised to the power of minus. We discussed about why it's minus. So rate multiplied by rate and raise rate is raised to the amount of values that is out here, right? So x by x factorial. Where's my mouse? Okay, so in this problem, you have alpha is already given to you. That is six. To find the probability, now to find. So to find means what I need. The probability that in 0.5 minute interval, at least one pulse is received. So for 0.5, 0 0.5 minute interval, I'm going to find one pulse is received. Note that the number of pulses in such an interval has a Poisson's distribution with a parameter of alpha t is equal to 6 into 0.5 is equal to 3. Now let's slow down. So you said that the alpha is given. Why can't I raise this to the power of 6, right? It can be very easy, so very confusing, right? So the alpha is already given. The rate is already given to us. Hang on. We are required to find out, note that the number of pulses in such an interval, there you go, you have the Poisson's distribution, so you underline that, with parameters alpha t. Now it's given, so remember um, I kind of specified lambda equals to np or alpha t, whichever way. So the alpha t out right, right out here is given uh, 6, that is, uh, alpha is equal to 6, this part, multiplied by 0.5. Why 0.5? I'll tell you exactly why. So alpha is basically the rate. So 6 per minute is what we are having right now. What we are going to calculate, so what we have is 6 per minute. What do we need? We need the number of pulses in such an interval with the parameter of 0.5 minutes is used because alpha is expressed as rate per minute. Now, where do I have this 0 0.5? 0 0.5 minute interval. So what we need to find the probability that in a 0.5 minute interval, 
So 0 0.5 minute interval, I didn't come up with this number. We are trying to find out at least one pulse is getting sent. What is the probability that at least one pulse is getting sent in this specified time? So that is why we have to actually calculate the rate since it's per minute. So we had per minute time and then we have a very specific time out here. So that rate is going to get multiplied with the time that we have. And that is why we have raised it to the power of three. OK, so that is the first part. Now what we need to find out to find the probability that in 0.5 minute interval at least. OK, not at most, at least one pulse is received. So at least one pulse is received. Remember in the previous problem we did at most and at least at least one pulse is getting removed. So one or more. How do you write this? One minus P of. If it's one or more, you can only subtract it from X equals zero, right? I mean, there is no other options for you. It's one or more. So that is why you can actually find out the PMF of this guy. How do you find out the PMF? Just substitute for X equals zero out here. This is your rate. So this is your rate. Now, what do I know? The alpha. Alpha is what? Zero. So zero raised to the power of three as well. And then divided by, oh, sorry. I did, I just wrote it the opposite way around. Sorry. That's the rate, right? So my bad. So multiplied by three, three raised to the power of how much? Zero by zero factorial. That's what is exactly done in this problem. So um, let me erase this all things because we have more parts coming up. So just be careful, okay? That uh, there is a specific rate given us, it given to us, but we might have a different time interval because in which we are trying to actually find out the probability. Okay. So let's move on. There's another problem though. So this problem you can actually work on out, work on out your own, but it's a similar problem. The number of n queries arriving at t seconds at a call center is at a Poisson's random variable with alpha is equal to lambda t, where lambda is the average rate at which the queries arrive. Now lambda is the average rate at which the, so it might be called alpha, it might be called lambda, but you need the t. What is the t? More than four queries in 10 seconds. So this 10 seconds is basically your t. Four queries means what? The number four. So more than four queries means n greater than four. That means one minus n less than four. You can put this in a formula and then find out the value. What is the part B? Fewer than five queries in two minutes. Fewer than five means n less than five. You can directly put this in the formula and find it out. So Poisson's problem is pretty much, um, it's intuitive that you would actually get to the conclusion that this is a Poisson's problem but you might or might not know how to solve the problem. So that is why we are constantly stressing on how to solve the problem. OK. So um, now we have another problem. Now we don't know anything about this problem being Poisson's or exponential or binomial or anything, but let's read the problem though. If a publisher of a non-technical book takes great pains to ensure that its book is free of typographical errors, so that the probability of any given page containing at least one such error is 0 0.005, so very less. And the errors are independent from page to page. That means one particular page error does not depend on the other particular page error. What is the probability that one of these 400 novels will contain exactly one page with errors, at most three page with errors? So exactly one means, you know, it's kind of like the X equals one, kind of situation and uh, at most three pages with errors is basically at most means till max. Till max is basically again less than equals three, so you can actually put it in a formula. But then um, look how we have 
considered. So S denoting a page consisting of at least one error, but the first case we have kind of approximated it to um, a, a Poisson's random variable. There is absolutely no mention of the word rate out here. We only have that if a publisher of a non-technical book is publishing something, there is an error probability rate. What we are trying to find out is the probability that one of its 400 pages contains exactly one page of error. So there is no rate involved in it. So at least one of the errors is a binomial random variable, but out here the N is quite large with respect to the P. Now remember, like again, just to reiterate, exponential random variable and binomial random variable, exponential can approximate binomial when the N is kind of larger and the P is kind of smaller as compared to N, right? So N of P is basically equal to two. That is why if, if you solve this by binomial, this will be perfectly fine, okay? The numbers might be a little bit off, but if you rather, I would rather that if you find a value which is comparatively more, the N is more than the probability, the probability is very less, you rather would apply exponential, uh, I'm sorry, uh, you rather apply, I mean, this would be a better sort of representation of applying Poisson's random variable instead of a binomial. Similarly, for the second case, at most three pages, again, it is approximated to a Poisson's. Again, if you want to solve it in a binomial random variable, this is won't be incorrect, but the correct more or rather more correct way of representing it is by the Poisson's. That is why, why? Because the N is large compared to the probability, which is very, very small. That is why. Uh, similarly, you have like various other problems for uh, Poisson's. It's basically the same thing. If you catch the rift of it, uh, you just have to be very careful with the probability and the n. So this is n and this is p. Please multiply that and then we'll um, talk about the specific times of the day. So this problem is what uh, we had taken up in the class. And somebody actually discussed about, OK, what about uh, the failure rate in two days? Can I add like failure rate plus one day plus failure rate for the other day? No, if you do the math correctly, 20 raised to the power of J and then we have 20 out here in the exponential as well. So basically, I actually worked out the math. This one is a much more greater value than if you consider each day. The, the, the factor being that N is kind of trying to represent the, the probability of that specific rate. So the rate is very important. Um, the rate is basically as still 0 to 10 because uh, we are trying to find out 10 or fewer fewer than 10 failures, but the rate has changed from 10 to 20 or from 20 to 10 in certain problems. Let me see if I can. Yeah, so uh, it, it is given per day. So per day, find the probability that there are no failures in a given day. So this is per day. So no, no probability you probably have found out very easily. Like it's just raised to the power of zero. But in two days, you basically have to multiply the rate. Why? Because in a previous problem, we have kind of seen that um, yeah, that the rate is given out here as alpha is six, but then we have to find it out in a specified interval of time. What is that specified interval of time? That is 0.5 minute. Even if the rate is given, we have to find out the distribution or we have to find out the probability distribution within that specified time. That is why we actually multiply that specified time in here. And in this case it's 20, that is why it's 20 raised to the power of J to the power of minus 20 by J factorial and J runs from 0 to 10 because we are trying to calculate that there are 10 or fewer failures in two days. Find the number of spare disk drives that should be available so that all failures in that day can be replaced with 99%. So basically for this problem, you have to read it slow. This and this part, mostly people get it, but for this part, you need to actually solve for something which is unknown, okay? So hang on. Find the number of spare disks, drive or disk drives. Okay, find the number of spare disk drives. That means other other types of disk drives that should be available so that all failure in the day can be replaced with a probability. So the failure is basically 99% or 0.99. 
So now I'm trying to find out the number of spare disks. So how do you do it? This is the distribution. This is what it looks like though. And you equate this distribution to 0.99. What is the unknown factor out here? The unknown factor out here is basically uh, the number, the number itself, right? Because we don't know how many number this is, but we, we know so for sure that it's 0.99 this error probability is 0.99. So you just solve for the value of that specific um, number K. So um, this type of problems, again, we won't necessarily given, but just to understand the probability uh, of this Poisson's distribution, you have a specific rate, you have a specific time associated with that rate. So please take into consideration the time, even if there is a specific rate given as NP, but you have to consider the specified time with that given problem. Similarly, this you can also do it. It's just another uh, type of problem where uh, we are trying to find out the um, some kind of um, police is inspecting something and then trying to estimate it that we have. Um, it's a similar problem as part um, part C that if we have like some kind of expression equated to some kind of probability. Now, to by trial and error, we can actually find out that this n required is kind of 50. This, this problem is not so much given from the exam perspective, just to explain you that we can actually also do brute force mechanism or kind of trial and error mechanism to find out which is the best possible value of n for which the probability is going to be 0 0.9. So you kind of have to keep increasing n until a value so that the probability does not cross this number. And for <laughs> unfortunately, I tried it till 50 times and then I saw that, yeah, almost in 50, um, we are having this particular case probability to be 0.9% and that is why n is equal to 50. But this is on trial and error basis, so probability is that you don't uh, get these problems in the exam. So uh, again, a uh, rough kind of uh, discussion of PDF and CDF is given out here. Uh, we have uh, several examples of coin toss. Probably this is coin toss experiments to explain you the CDF concept. Uh, again, the CDF concept and the PDF concept. So we are trying to differentiate this specific point of time to get the PDF. So that is why the PDF are just impulses from this straight line. So if you differentiate that, only the impulses would remain though, right? So those are the impulses and uh, we are going to do more of PDF though. So no problem. Now, this is the continuous cases. So continuous cases till now we have seen binomial, geometric and Poisson's random variable for only discrete cases. Now we are going to move on to the continuous cases where cases are get, going to get a little bit more interesting because now um, we have to find out certain intervals, remember? So uh, let's now just quit this slide for now. And go back to my uh, previous problem slides. As you can see that we are almost very close to getting done. So congratulations on that. But we still have to discuss again out here. This, this problem set also I'm going to actually upload it. This problem set also has a, has like very simple examples of PMF. Just toss a coin twice and head is observed. What is the probability and then all the other things. Similarly, CDF also I have like taken a very simple example. And I've tried to find out what is the CDF of this and how is the CDF finally represented. If we have time, I'll come back to it. But um, more from the problem set. So let me go back and show you Canvas. So in Canvas, you will have certain assignments uploaded by me. Uh, first is the homework solution two. Second is the additional problem sets for the exam. And if you click this, you'll find all the PPT that we are discussing in the class previously and in the class right now. It's uploaded out here as well as in the assignments for homework three. You have the homework three assignment out here. I have my um, homework uh, problems that uh, that we are going to discuss right now. Oops, not this one. Uh, this is basically taken from that exam problems. All right, so we are going to now describe uh, each of the problems and how we are going to use that. Again, the solutions will be uploaded tomorrow. So some of the solutions that you see out here will be uploaded. I mean, all of it will be uploaded tomorrow, so you don't need to worry about kind of taking it down. You'll have the solution almost ready for your use for tomorrow. All right, but we, we have to kind of understand what is going on, though. 
before we can um, actually solve the problems. So this is like a Poisson problem. We have been doing these type of problems in the past uh, problem sessions like out here. So this is all your Poisson problem, right? So we have been doing these type of problems for quite some time. But just as a revision again, I just tend to repeat myself, but it's more from the perspective of um, just getting you revised more and more and more. So so that when you see this problem set, you kind of know what to study and where to go after this. Uh, if you do not understand Poisson's distribution, it is just that it's it's a distribution trying to approximate certain types of random variables, trying to categorize those random variables in certain way. So there are specific types of situation which can be very well approximated by Poisson's random variable, very flexible random variable, in fact. So any type of random requests that happen, like random Brownian motion or uh, emission of particles from a radioactive substance, or in this case, we have the number of page requests that arrive at a web server. These specific examples are basically all Poisson's random variable. Poisson's random variable is a very good approximation of these random types of experiments or random types of emissions or random types of uh, requests that we get. And uh, it has worked over the past. It's not just um, you know me saying it. Um, so that is why we kind of can use the Poisson's random variable to kind of approximate these. Why, why is it required for approximation? Well, we certain times we kind of want to, uh, for in this case, if you uh, if you have learned a little bit of networking or if you have learned a little bit of data communication classes or those type of classes, or even if you study telecom, you would know that the data is basically sent in packets. So there is a whole lot of engineering in how to read out the packages and queuing and all those. I'm not going to get into them, but um, so it, it might be very important for us to find out the probability that there are no requests sent in a certain period of time. That means the system is idle. And there is like five to ten requests in a certain period of time. That means there is light traffic in that uh, specific uh, channel. So these things are kind of important. We are not just calculating them just for fun. These are practical like problems, you know, that we that we face. Or maybe as a data com engineer or something else. I don't. But these are problems that we actually face day to day life. So just a background. So that's why we are learning these things so that we can use them. Similarly for Gaussian as well, uh, Gaussian uh, random variable, you will actually try to appreciate Gaussian more when you come to chapter eight or chapter seven, specifically when you actually de describe or um, uh, talk about the central limit theorem, you would actually uh, definitely appreciate Gaussian much, much more. Very surprising. Um, some of the factors are very surprising uh, for Gaussian. So similarly, so uh, well, uh, this is also a similar kind of uh, typical kind of request problem that there is an average of 6000 requests per minute. Find the probability that there is no request in a 100 millisecond period. So uh, in a 100 millisecond period, again, uh, I think I have already discussed this type of problem or this specific problem. It is just that in 6000, 6000 requests per minute, is trying to kind of get reduced down to a 100 millisecond period. So this is per minute, remember? So let me just take my pen. So this is per minute, OK? Just to actually point it out. And what we are requiring is in 100 milliseconds. So how do you find that out? So well, you can actually do a unitary method where in one minute, so 6,000 requests in one minute, or one minute is equivalent to 6,000 requests. So in one, uh, 60 seconds, basically in 60 second, oops, you have 6,000 requests, right? Oops, that's not the correct value. So 6,000, then you can find it out in one second, then you can find it out in 100 milliseconds, right? So I have found out that the, in 100 milliseconds, it's kind of like 10 requests in 100 milliseconds. So I did not come up abruptly with this number. It's just that this is the calculation behind it. So, well, you already know that this is P of Y equal to zero. Why? Because no request. How how to represent no request or zero request or anything? Well, we have to just put in P of Y is equal to zero or X is equal to zero, whichever your random variable is. And then you have to just, well, if it is zero, then you are just left with the exponential part. Why? Because this lambda is basically zero, right? So this is basically e to the power of lambda, lambda to the power of K, and then divided by K factorial, right? 
So if this if this guy itself is zero, I'm sorry, that guy is not zero. I make this mistake every time. So basically, right now, what is happening is um, lambda to the power of zero divided by zero factorial. And remember, zero factorial is one. So this is one. This is one. So only we left with this. What is lambda? Lambda, we have already found out that it's 10. Why is it 10? Because this is the rate that is given to us, and we have to multiply the rate with that specific time limit that we have for that specific problem. And that is why it is basically um, e to the power of minus 10. Now you can leave the answer like this, or you can actually find it out. Both will give you same points. Uh, but however, if you just leave it at here, for example, like if you don't kind of try to reevaluate this, some points might be deducted because this can be actually simplified a, a little bit more. So, you know. Uh, but uh, if you leave the answer at here and do not use your calculator because you ran out of time or something, it's perfectly fine. Uh, you'll get the full points. Now, similarly, five to ten requests means it's within five requests. Again, within five and less than ten. So x equals five to ten, not beyond ten, not less than five. So uh, just put the formula down. You have the values already. I calculated the values individually, and we came up with this final number. Remember, the probability should be always between 0 and 1. So this is kind of like a check that you have done all your calculation steps perfectly. Um, similarly, uh, you have other problems of Poisson's, but we are not going to go over them because I need to cover a very important problem of PMF. And these type of problems you might or might not get in the exam, but this is an important problem nevertheless. So first of all, you have come across PMF. Uh, and from the previous discussions of PMF, you know that PMF at a certain point, right? So PMF at a certain point means how do you express the PMF though? Where's my mouse? So P of X equal to, right? X equal to whatever number, right? This is your PMF. So you also know the properties of PMF. So the first property of PMF is kind of given out here and I told you that this is important. Why? Because we are going to solve problems from this. What is the first problem though? The first problem is that PMF is given with some kind of distribution. So basically um, what this means is basically P of K, okay? So it's not PK, it's P of K and it's given by C divided by K square. And Again, K is basically having values on the real number, uh, real number line. That is K basically belongs to R, but I'm not going to write that, so it's fine. Uh, so K basically belongs to that. What we are wanting to find out, find out a value of C numerically. OK, so. Remember, the properties will be given at the back. I am not going to tell you that this this is the property that you have to use in order for you to find out the value of C. But well. Um, so let me just go back and see if I have given the property somewhere. Yeah, so, so you see the number two, this is the encircled property, so this is what we are using. Let me come back. OK, yeah, I was just actually checking if my solution is wrong, uh, right or not. So my yeah, my solution is right. OK, so basically this guy is going to be given in your exam. Certain types of summations are having certain types of, you know, uh, value uh, because you might not know what is the uh, summation end result. So it looks like pi square by six. So this is this will be given to you. Having given this, if C is equal to this type of value, this guy is basically what I'm trying to say is this guy is basically pi square by six, right? So what is C then? C is equal to just flip the value now. So C times pi square by six is one. So C is equal to six divided by pi square, right? So that's exactly what we have found out. Now we can substitute that value out here in place of C and we'll find out that um, the the entire expression is now p of k is basically equal to six by pi square that is the constant multiplied by one by k square. 
So this, why is this important? Why? Because we have to find out part B. What is part B? X greater than five. Remember, if something is greater than five, we can always flip it. So that is what we have done out here. Now, OK, we have uh, we have flipped it. That's great. But how do we evaluate this? Well, this is basically a PMF, right? And the PMF distribution is given out here. So what we are going to do is we are going to find out from one to five. Why? Because the limits are given till five, right? Till five, we have to find out. And then we can just send the constant outside and we can take K square. So it's literally just variating K from one to five. So one, then one by four, then one by nine, one by 16, and then you can find out the numerical value with the constant, then subtract it from one and then find out the total value. So easy, but you have to know how to do it though. So you need some amount of practice. So when you're going through this video, you can actually sit with a pen and paper and actually since I'm going slow, you can revise with me. Now within five and seven, again, there's a property for this. Um, uh, just try to find out the property. It's basically some number subtracted with the other number. OK, and that specific uh, formula. So for this specific value and for this specific value, you can find out the basic. Um, uh, basic PMF and then subtract it to find out the values. So you you have you have uh, a property for that though. So just try to do it on your own. I might not have given the property, but it's basically subtraction of the higher limit from the lower limit. That's all. So you find it out for seven or you can actually. Oh, you can actually take from five to seven as well. Yeah, sure. Why not? So you can take only for five, six and seven. So this will have the C outside. And what you need to do is you need one by twenty five. Plus one by thirty six plus one by um, 49. And then you have to multiply that by C, which whatever C is, pi squared by six, and that is your final answer, okay? So that's easy. Next, next is an important problem. Um, I'm going to go slow out here, okay? Because uh, this problem and this problem is very, very important. If you understand these two problems, you are going to get through most of your exam material because CDF and PDF is such an important concept because we have deliberately basically stopped before the functions of random variable. When you go to the functions of random variable, things starts getting a little bit complex. Now you can see that what we have done is basically taken the concepts of probability, put them in some axioms, have some corollaries out of it, and then kind of try to shape the random variables or just the variables in some kind of distribution and say them that, OK, these distributions have these mathematical expressions and they have some properties which can be defined as their mean or their variance. And then we have these distributions of PDF and CDF or PMF. Um, so it's kind of building up on the concepts until you reach the point where you actually have functions. And functions are nothing but, you know, just FX. Plain and plain FX kind of situation, but when they kind of. Um, so th th that would be like a huge leap forward from here. So these concepts that we are building, especially problem number four and five will kind of help you with those concepts. That is why you are being tested on these concepts in these exams. All right, so you're not just learning it because you have to learn it. It's kind of trying to build the concepts on further. All right. Um, I think we are close to two hours. Um, I don't know how the meeting will last, how long the meeting is going to last, but we are going to continue until uh, we finish off the problems in this slide, as well as the other slide that I have uploaded already. This slide I have not uploaded. This is what I'm going to upload along with the uh, video, recorded video of this uh, session. Uh, yes, you are also going to have these recorded video sessions. I have not decided whether I am going to upload this specific video or maybe I'm going to make another video of it, but mostly I think I'll upload these specific videos uh, on our YouTube channel or HKN, and I'm also going to share the link of that so that in future 
if at any point of time you need to revise these concepts, you'll always have it on YouTube and. Um, yeah, so you can revise at that specific point of time as well. Uh, probably I'm going to have upload a new video on YouTube because I also share a lot of announcements, class announcements there, and you probably don't require those class announcements. So I'll 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 say about that later. But yes, we, you have the facilities of um, seeing these videos later as well. So uh, either on Canvas, if you cannot download from Canvas, you can also see them on YouTube later in some format or the other. Let me see how I can do it. So now we have talked about the concept of CDF, right? So we have, however, not discussed PDF. We have just stopped at CDF. Now, if you know the properties of CDF, you would know that Everything that is done in summations in PMF uh, will be a continuous range. That means it's for continuous random variable. And more often than not, they have some properties. What are those properties? Those properties are basically first that fx of x lies between 0 and 1. Second is that if you kind of climb all the way towards my, okay, let me use my pointer so that you understand. So this is you. You are trying to go towards my uh, positive infinity. And if you are this function, your value is going to more and more and more go closer to one until you are actually one. And if you are walking towards negative infinity, you should be walking more towards zero until you actually reach zero. So this is a norm decreasing function. The third property, the very basic property, we actually kind of use this property in PMF as well, is that upper limit minus lower limit kind of subtraction going on out here x equals to b is x of b minus that extreme left point that we have you know so we'll we'll see how we, how we can do that um uh, with problems though and then the other property is that if you have already seen this multiple times by now if it is greater than some number you can flip it and say it's less than some number right so these are the properties that we started with there is one more property that is very important the, that important property is this, that if you are having a CDF, that CDF should not be greater than one or less than zero. So having said that, uh, this is how it's represented. Now we are actually going to take our uh, problem. Oops, sorry. That's um, jumping the guns a little bit. Now, um, we have a similar problem out here, as you can see, that kind of tells you that, well, you have the random variable. So uh, let's read this slow, okay? The random, because these type of problems you're seeing for the first time. Now, remember, till now, you have kind of seen problems like this in a PMF, right? Where you have a function distribution and you're trying to actually evaluate the values of that. But till now, it's like a word problem. Till now, like all the problems that you have is a word problem. Now, this is a new type of problem that you're seeing. And that problem has certain description. So we are going to go slow on what each parts of the problem mean and how to kind of read the problem, though, OK? So the random variable X, so X capital X is basically the random variable and it has a CDF. It has a cumulative distribution function and that function is defined like this. So basically cumulative distribution function or any other types of function is just a function, you know, and functions we have kind of come across just FX. So this is just a function, right? And that function can be any variables of X. You can take just anything, right? You can take it as a straight line. You can take it as a parabola, whatever it is. So it's just a function. Now that function will have some definition because you can either say it's for all X or you can have some ranges of that. So it is just a function, but it is what type of function? It's CDF, OK? So zero for X less than zero. Why? Because the CDF cannot be defined beyond zero. Remember the first property? So, so that is zero. And then beyond one, it's always one. Why? Because again, this property. So imagine this, that it starts from zero and it kind of takes on the value of one. 
So from zero to one, this kind of is increasing function because it's not decreasing. It's an increasing function and then it kind of settles at one. So as you go towards infinity, the more you go towards infinity, it's always going to be one. The more you go towards minus infinity, it's always going to be zero. That's the properties of it. So you, you should not be surprised to see a value of one out here and a value of zero out here because that's the property. And this is X less than zero. This is X beyond one. It's just a static value. Now, what is interesting is what is happening between these limits. So between these limits, it's kind of having a distribution. Now, again, this is just a function. It's a it's a kind of um, a bias kind of situation added to a function. So the function is having a constant, however, which is C. Now we are try, trying to find out what is the first question. We are trying to find out what is the value that C can assume. Now, how do you find that out? Well, you know that FX is a non-decreasing function, so you can have different values of C at different instances of X. So what are those instances of X that we can find out? Well, we have zero. And then we have one. So if x, so if you put x is equal to zero out here, what do we have? We have c 0 0.5 plus c sine square zero. Right? So you have basically 0 0.5 plus 0 0.5 c. X, I'm sorry, that's for 0 0.5. For, for x equals to zero, this is obviously zero. Sine zero is zero. So for 0 0.5, you have 0 0.5 c, and for one, you have 0 0.5 plus c because sine one plus. So now you have the range of values, right? So you can put that as you variate X, so this specific value is lying between this one and this one. This is a non-decreasing function, right? So this is less than this is less than this. So now um, you could solve for, with this three specific expressions, you could solve for the value of C, but you will see soon that you can actually specify the range of C rather than the C. So that is why the range of C out here is 0 to 0 0.5. Now, if you don't understand this math, I'll be more than happy to explain you, but this is out of the scope of discussion right now, because what we are trying to find out is understand how to solve the problem. So basically, you can take one of the limits. So you can take 0 0.5 plus C, which is this guy, is greater than 0 0.5 and then find out one limit of C and then again take 0 0.5 plus C is basically less than equal to one because all of the limits are, are should be like less than equal to one. So you can find out another value of C and then you can actually say that it lies between 0 and 0 0.5. You can start with any of them. Like you can start with this guy as well. You can start with this guy as well. It just depends on how you are going to solve these specific sets of equations that you have. Um, So C is basically a range out here right now. So comparing it with the PMF where you can directly use this formula and you have like one specific value of X, this time we have a range of value of X's. Now what plot the CDF. Now usually plotting of the CDF, it might come, but it is for very simple functions and it's just plotting the function. Okay. So plotting CDF is nothing but plotting the function. And how, how can you plot the function? Let's, uh, let me show you that, but let me write this as plotting function. OK, this is just plotting the function. Now, how do you plot the function? First of all, you have to have the fx of x. So what is the fx of x, though? So fx of x is basically right now, it's either 0, right? If you follow this specific range, and then you have 0 0.5. And then you have um, 1. Right? For these ranges. If x is less than 0, right? If x is less than 0, well, it's already 0. We know that. And if x is greater than 1, we already know that this is 1, right? So the left is 0 0.5. Why is it 0 0.5 though? So C can lie between 0 to 0 0.5. 0 to 0 0.5. This is the range. If it lies between 0 to 0 0.5, um, basically 
this this part is going to actually be affected because 0 0.5 is the basic value. Now the basic value, if you take between if you take the range of x between 0 and 1, the least value can be 0 0.5 when c is basically 0. Because c can take any values between 0 and 0 0.5. Now, if it takes 0 0.5, uh, that will also lead us to some values. But sine square uh, pi x by 2 at x is equal to that specific value is 0 0.5 plus 0 0.5 c. So C can again take any values from 0 to 0 0.5. So this is this this stuff is going to actually vary it then. And the highest limit is 0 and the lowest limit is basically. Oh, actually the highest limit of C is 0. No, the lowest limit of C is 0. The highest limit of C is 0 0.5. So we have kind of written the max value of C out here. So um, again, the mathematics is not as important as the fact that what we are doing out here. Math is obviously important because we need to find out what we are trying to do. But here I have kind of considered that C is zero. So for C is equal to zero, we can have one case, but the max case though for zero to 0 0.5, if I consider C as zero, that means this portion is zero. That means only this DC value is left. So only the DC value have written down. OK, so you can actually take for um, C is equal to 0 0.5 as well. Like that is also an option. So and then the function values are going to change. Whatever I've just tried to make my life a little bit easier. So for any values, so you then plot it, right? So your Y axis should also always contain the CDF. Your X axis is basically X. This small X. This small X that we have out here, that is basically here. Okay. I'm just going to erase that because that looks ugly. Um, let me see. Yeah. So well, so now what we are trying to do is to plot it. So this is your y axis. This is your x axis. So you start traversing from zero. Why? Because everything less than zero is zero. Now when you suddenly reach the point zero, you have a jump. Jump of how much? 0 0.5. OK, so that is ended. Why? Because. Uh, I mean, you cannot jump beyond that. That's that's the point. But then from 0 to 1, you continue in the 0 0.5 range, right? And then it becomes 1. Actually. And then it becomes one, right? And then the one kind of continues, right? I'm just going to represent it by a delta function. So is this point included or excluded? Well, within zero and one. So this point is kind of included. This point is also kind of included. That's the point. So you don't need to go into the details of uh, what, whether the point is included or excluded. Just if you would have drawn a specific diagram out here, just representing this much, that would be uh, perfect. So that's your plotting. Now we have to find out the value, one of the specific values. What is the value? P of X greater than zero. First of all, we'll write it invertly, right? And X less than equal to zero means FX of zero, right? Because, I mean, you cannot have anything beyond zero because fx is only defined within fx of x is only defined within the boundaries of less than zero and greater than one. I mean, greater than one is just going to be one, and this is just going to be zero. So fx at at the point zero. So fx at the point zero is what? So oh, here's my mouse. Oh, okay, never mind. So fx at the point 0 is 0 0.5, right? So you just substitute that value with 0 0.5. 1 minus 0 0.5 is 0 0.5. And that is what um, our value of uh, x less than 0 is. Now I have also taken for a case of 0 0.5. Now I have started with c is equal to 0. And I've also done the case of 0 0.5. Now if you leave at case one for C is equal to zero, assuming C is equal to zero, you can get full points. Unless I mention that 
please also show that this, this and this, then you can do either of them. But I, for uh, students who are actually interested in the calculations of how the function is going to actually get represented, I have also shown how to do it for uh, 0.5. It's the same thing. Uh, and it's basically the same calculations as well. So just very simple math. You just need to understand what to do though. Okay. So now we are going to actually go into the concepts of PDF. Now PDF is also similarly for continuous cases, right? So I'm now going to refer to a, your book so that I can get you the page number for it. This probability mass function. By the way, you can also read your book, so you don't always need to refer to um, my slides. OK, so um, I'm covering material from page. 148 for your reference, but again, if you want to read the book, be my guest. So what we are trying to discuss is PDF. So what is PDF though? We are soon going to find out by the properties of what it means. So PDF is called probability density function. So probability density function, well, in probability density function, what we can actually have is um, some properties as well. So what first let us define what is PDF. So PDF is nothing but small f. It represents by small f, capital X, and small x. So that is basically equal to D of capital F X. So you can actually understand that when you have a CDF, you basically need to differentiate that CDF in order to get the PDF. That's all. But it does have some properties. So PDF basically represents the density of the probability at that specific point X. Uh, well, uh, an easier way to actually represent the density is basically you can take the PDF to be the shape of the curve, OK? And you can actually try to imagine the CDF till a certain point at a value X to be the area under that curve until that point X coming from the right side or left side, whichever side you prefer. But if you if you consider the left side, then the right side will be one minus that. If you consider the left side, uh, right side, then the one minus that. But the point is that until you come approaching from certain point, until that point, the area under the curve is basically what is CDF, and how the density function looks like or how the random variable looks like is kind of defined by the PDF. Just non-mathematical definitions, uh, just to remember what kind of properties they might have. So the properties of Fx of x is similar to CDF because it's just a differentiation. So this has to be obviously greater than zero. Oopsie. That's the first part. The second part is that um, if you have to write within limits, say for example, if I have, um, let's write A less than X less than B, then how are we going to write that in, in, the, in, in terms of PDF? So, or in terms of CDF rather. So remember, if fx of x is a differentiation, if I have to find out if the PDF is given to me, and if I have to find out the CDF, we integrate, right? That's the opposite of differentiation. So in terms of CDF, how do you write this in PDF terms? So limits a, small a, this is the smaller limit out here, to b, you write fx of x, bx. We are trying to find out the P CDF of that within that specific range. So this is how you write it. 
Now, the most important property I would think, let me rub that off, uh, is kind of important for us to remember, especially in terms of numerical problems, is um, this property. That's why I kind of rubbed everything in, because this is an important property and you need to remember this quite often. Basically, when we are integrating the uh, the uh, PDF in order to get certain CDF, if you integrate it from minus infinity to infinity, or just the area under the curve, whichever limits it is. So area under the curve of that particular PDF, that is basically equal to one. This is a very, very important property. We are going to use this several times and um, in several specific ways. So this is kind of like the property that is getting used for the first part of the problem. That is to find out the constant C. Right, so how do you find out the constant? You know that integration of this specific problem would give you one. So if you kind of solve the integration within this specific range. So if the formula tends to have minus infinity to infinity, that means it's kind of trying to generalize the cases. It doesn't mean that you also have to take minus infinity to infinity. See the function definition. The function definition is only defined. This function is only valid from minus one to one. So you cannot take minus infinity to infinity and get uh, valid results. So this function has to be from minus one to one and then C of whatever and then solve for C. And C will have a specific value out here. Substitute that value back to the function to get the actual function. Now, this part should be similar to the part of uh, PMF and kind of similar to the part of CDF as well. So I'm not going in details of this for the sake of time because uh, we are half an hour away and uh, I would like to actually kind of recap and revise. Now, important thing is that we have to cover um, variance and mean as well. So variance and mean is basically just formula based. What I'll be pointing out is what students do, um, where students go wrong and where your points are deducted or how my rubrics kind of looks like when I'm trying to actually grade. And this has been obviously stated by Dr. D. So if you have any problems with your grades at any point of time, you can always go to Dr. D and talk to him. Excuse me. So. Right now, what you have right now is basically. Uh, the plot of the CDF, so plot of the CDF can only happen when you know what the CDF looks like, right? I mean, duh. so this plot I have given you just to make you explain that. Um, this is what the function looks like. You're not required to plot it. I have just explained you how to plot it in case you want to plot it. OK, what you are asked, however, in part B of the problem is to plot the CDF of X. So typically if this type of problem comes in, you can have like 10 points on this problem, 10 points on this problem. Uh, let's see, one, two, three, four. So maybe 20 points on this problem and again, five plus five, 10 points on this problem. So you can see 20 plus 10 plus 10 plus 10, right? So 50 points alone can be actually given on this problem. I mean, I'm not saying that it's going to be like that, but it's important. OK, so um, I'm just going to erase that because that's not the truth, but I mean, this problem is actually that important though. So this is like a bulk problem that you can get in your exams and you should know at least how to solve this. Okay. So let's try and solve and understand how to solve it. First of all, the C part. The C part is from one of the properties. This property, this formula is going to be given at the back of your exam, but you need to remember that you need to use this property in order to find out the value of C. You should have an exact value of C in this case because you know the exact thing. This is not a range like CDF. This is the exact value. So substitute that value in the function, and then what we are going to do is to calculate the CDF. Now CDF, again, this formula will be given at the back of your exam. You need to know that you have to use this. What do we do? Well, we have the PDF this time. So remember, if CDF is going to be the, if you differentiate CDF to get PDF, now if you have PDF, you're going to just integrate to get the CDF. So you just integrate it. Now, this is where all the students almost go wrong. 
CDF, remember the definition of CDF is P of X until some certain value. OK, until some certain value. How does it look like though? So if you if you've plot a CDF, what you're trying to do is remember that if PDF gives you the you know, distribution function, the CDF is going to be a value called X and you're trying to find out the area under almost the area under the curve until that specific value of X. So in order to find out all the integration between these whatever limit your function has, say your limit, your function is only defined till a point from A, till a point called B, okay? So this is B and this is A, and your function is defined within that specific point. But I want to find out the CDF till a point called X, not till a point called B, a random point called X. So your limits of minus one, that is your lower limit is going to stay here. Upper limit is going to be X. Why? It is PX of small x. Right? And then your distribution, which you have written out here, which is basically this guy, and you are trying to integrate that guy because that's your PDF, and you're trying to find out the CDF until that specific point X, that is the small x. And that is why your entire equation is going to remain in terms of X. So let me write this out because people are going to forget this. Remain in terms of X. OK, now. Well, you can actually now take uh, this, uh, the, the specific values of X and just do a trial and error to find out because you have to plot this. You need some points for plotting. So I have taken minus one because I, I understood that well. If I take minus one, a lot of things are going to get canceled out. So it turns out fx of minus one is zero. So beyond anything in this graph, it's zero out here. OK, so it's all zero. Till minus infinity, it's zero. Now I have also found out that if you take one, it's going to be one. So any point beyond one uh, until my until infinity, it's all going to be one. So this function is somehow defined between the values of minus one and one. So what is the distribution? It's half. So when this this straight, oh, this is not a straight line. So you can understand that this is a ramp because it has a zero crossing at y axis, right? So that's how you decide that this is a ramp and it crosses the y axis at the point 0, 0.5. That's your plot. That is going to give you the full points. OK, so this is how, how did I come up with these specific points? This is just me trying to explore the functions at different points. You can do it at fx at 2, fx at 3, fx at 0.5. You're going to come up with um, values uh, that will help you plot the function. That's all. Um, that's all it, actually. Just the plot. Now, what about the value of x equals 0? So at x equals 0, the CDF is basically a continuous function. So at any, like at x equals zero, that is at this specific point of time, that that varies, like that very dot of time, that value is zero. So if if I if I if I kind of try to define CDF, it would be from okay, what is the range or what is the PDF of that value? Now this is not same for the discrete case though. For discrete case, you have for one specific value, one specific point of value. But for a continuous case, there is a math behind it where for one specific value, you cannot have one specific point because that value can also be infinite and dis distributed again with lots of other values. So um, that is why the PDF of that specific value for a continuous case only is zero. OK. Now, where's my mouse? OK. What the hell? All right. So now then how is the PDF going to be kind of like how do you like define a P of something? So P of something can be defined as a range. Now what is that range? You have the upper limit minus the lower limit. But hang on. What about exactly at this point? 
and exactly at this point. So exact points are obviously zero because this is continuous case. So you just have the range of 0.5 and you have the range of points. Uh, you have the range of zero. So remember at 0.5, um, basically what, whatever your value comes out to be out here and whatever your value comes out to be at less than zero, uh, you already have this uh, CDF. Dis is my is my pointer okay you already have the distribution so you know less than zero kind of have this kind of value greater than zero has this kind of value greater than 0 0.5 has this kind of value so you can substitute that but basically the point of this entire discussion is that at that specific point for a continuous value the value is zero now for mean and variance you already know the formula for it if you want to actually check the formula, I think I have the formula sheet out here somewhere. Um, you can actually go and look at uh, a, a previous lecture or a previous problem slides. You'll actually find the formula. I'm not looking up to your book and actually giving you that because we are almost um, near to the time that we have to finish off. So fx of x is basically your 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 PDF is given, right? This is your given PDF. And where did you find this guy out? You calculated this in part A. So your part A was to cal calculate the constant. So this is the constant, nothing but the constant. So E of X is basically your function. That is your distribution that this is just your distribution. So X, FX, X, DX within that specified range. So if you if you have to write the formula for expected value, remember it's just the mean. And how do you find out the mean is basically integration with that specified limit x. Fx of x that is the distribution and then dx, right? So that is how you define the function. So now within minus one to one, you have this specific function. So three fourth, whatever that function is, you have to basically calculate within that specified range and whatever that value is, uh, if it comes out to be zero, it's zero. As you can see that it came out to be zero, but whatever the value is, you have to just calculate and this is your mean or the expected value. How do you calculate the variance? You uh, in order for you to calculate the variance, you need E of X square and E of X whole square. So this is E of X whole square. So E of X you already have E of X whole square is obviously again zero because E of X is zero. All you need to do is to find out E of X squared. Now, if you square the inside, you have to square the function as well. That is why you have x squared one minus x squared like that. That's why this is the expression. Actually, this guy has done something wrong. Because. Um, let me see. Yeah, so um, this this particular expression now this actually this is a solution from the book, so. What you need to do is text. Let me write the formula again. All right, perfect. Uh, yeah, and now how do you do this problem? This problem is basically um, calculating the E of X square. So what is the formula for that? The distribution is going to remain the same. OK, so again, minus one to one. The distribution FX of X is going to be untouched fx of x dx is going to be same. What you do is instead of x, you have x squared, OK? Because you're trying to find out the, the expected value of the x squared. That is why you have x squared. fx of x dx is just going to be the same, and you have to practically integrate that. This is just integration, uh, plain integration. I am going to give you the integration tables this time, but ideally you should remember that x squared integration is basically x cubed by 3. But still, I'm going to give you the integration tables and I have to actually have to take it down because I'll forget. OK, but ideally you should know how to integrate and if you do not know how to integrate, you can actually come to me. I'll teach you how to integrate and you will have tables where you can actually compare and find out how to integrate these and put the limits in and then find out the values. So variance is basically E of X squared. This formula will be given at the back of your exam. You should know how to use it though. 
So does the value minus the expected value whole square and that comes out to whatever value it is. So you can see that this is very mechanical, but you need to kind of practice this in order for you to start the problem. Because in probability, you know what to do, but you don't know how to start. So basically, you have to practice that in order for you to start. So this is basically the last problem from this problem slides. So I'm just going to actually um, share the other slides that are there. Um, this one. OK, so uh, basically where we stopped was. Let's see. So this is a Poisson's problem. Uh, this Poisson's problem was actually I'm trying. I was trying to discuss it in the class, but the basic thing is that um, you should know that the rate is given and the rate that we have for two days or three days or ten days or five millisecond, ten millisecond that should be applied. So why am I switching back and forth, back and forth, and why am I not kind of going in a synchronous way? Is because in exams you are going to not get a problem like, OK, first you have Bayes rule, then you have conditional probability, then you have Poisson's and that's not going to be the case. First, you might have a CDF problem, then it might be a Poisson's problem, then it might be a binomial, then it might be Bayes rule. So you have to practice like this. So that you can be dynamically switching between the concepts. So that is why I have deliberately kind of designed this problem session to exactly mimic the thinking process that you should have in your exams. OK, um, so kind of study the basics of again. There is a lot of problems on CDF and PDF out here as well. So um, this is basically from your book. And there's a three coin toss experiments starting from the three coin toss experiments on how we can actually kind of build the entire concept of CDF and PDF. Uh, you have that. So let's try and do some of it, you know, not all of it. This is actually an interesting problem. You can go through it if you have time, though. Not 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 required for in greater details, but this is one of the counting method problems that I found out was interesting and I included that. But this is basically um, you can you can solve this problem by binomial. So a lot of binomial problems as well out here, just in case. So this is Poisson's. We discussed a little bit of Poisson's as well. Um, this is not Poisson's, but you can solve this by Poisson's because the probability is very low and the N is kind of quite high, so you can actually approximate the binomial with Poisson's. The data center, it's yeah, this is also Poisson's. This problem I was kind of discussing in the class where some of you asked that whether we can actually substitute it with one day rate and then add the another day rate. You could do it, but the values might not end up in correct ways. Now this is an inspector problem. This is also an exponential problem. Um, so finally we come to PDF and you can see that there are quite a lot of examples of PDF. And basically the college professor never finishes his lecture before the end of the hour and always finishes his lecture within two minutes after the hour. So basically you have the FX of X, find the value of K, and then what is the probability that the lecture ends within one minute? So you might not have you know the um, so you might what I'm trying to say is you might not have the you know the the mathematical expressions that X less than one. You might not actually get this one. You might get it in words, which you have to kind of convert it into a, a problem like this. So uh, that is why I'm kind of discussing at the end because you might actually get confused if you read this problem and not know how to interpret it. So what is the probability that the lecture ends within one minute of the end hour? So what do you mean by that though? So within end limit of one hour means that if his lecture ends, if the if his lecture ends before the end of the one hour and always finishes his lecture within two minutes after the hour, so you have an upper range and a lower range. What is the upper range? The upper range is obviously zero. The lower range is within one hour. So again, read the problem and try to find out the ranges. Put the distribution within that specific range and try to find out the uh, distribution. 
I have a part C and a D, but I haven't given that part C and a D in the problem, so please ignore these guys. Uh, as you can see that there are very specific ranges as well. So 0 to 1, 1 to 1 1.5, greater than 1.5, but you can understand that the lecture, if it continues more than 1.5 hours, 1 to 1.5 hours. So this is just basic math, but these problems are not included, so please just concentrate on part A and part B. Now, what is part A though? Part A is just find out the K and draw the corresponding density curve. Now you can understand that this is an X square. X square is kind of just, you know, a positive function, right? So uh, that is why it's just positive function. You know, anything anything beyond uh, zero is basically zero, and then it's kind of like a parabola upstairs. So you don't have to exactly measure the uh, the K value or the constant value and how is it variating. So you just give a rough sketch of it. Um, what about this problem though? So let's find out that in a three coin toss experiment, X takes on only values of 0, 1, 2, and 3. So there are three coin tosses going on, okay? Excuse me. And the probabilities are 1 by 8, 3 by 8, 3 by 8, 1 by 8, because again, we are taking the count of heads, we are taking the count of tails, we are taking the count of head or tail and stuff like that. So, um, this is this is pretty this should be pretty much comfortable problem because you have done this problem or read this problem in binomial case. So I'm not going to repeat the how is it one by eight or why is it three by eight? However, uh, if you have to find out the um, CDF of X in this case, you just take each of the uh, values that are there and just multiply it with the distribution, right? So. Again, if you have like this problem is very specifically defined very well in your book. So first of all, you have to find out that the values of specific ranges from 0 to 1, 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 and uh, 3 and beyond. So if the number of tosses are obviously fair, we can use CDF to find the probabilities of the events. So 1 to 2 and 0 0.5 to 2.5 and 1 to 2 again. So basically this 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 practice of noticing whether this is greater than or equal to and then just greater than this is very important that is how your events will be different so one to two is basically fx of two minus fx of one now how is this different from this guy so this guy is basically you have to subtract minus one as well what is minus one minus one is basically if this is your point, the point just left to that. So what you're trying to include the point, only this point and anything left of that is subtracted out. So remember we talked about a property of CDF and we mentioned that if at that specific point we have to take a value, we have to subtract that from X of B minus. So I, and I said, I promised you that we are going to do a problem on that. So here it is. So basically when you try to um, include a certain point into the consideration, you subtract the very next left limits of it. So fx of 2 minus, so fx of 2, this is the upper limit, right? Anything in the upper limit minus anything in the lower limit, um, just, just like anything, like not just that point, just anything left to that point though. So 1 minus, minus fx of x equals to 2y, because the equal to sign is not out here though, right? This included the equal to sign. This included the equal to sign. So I kind of took every values that is from this range to this range, including two. Now this time we have to take in every values of excluding one, but we have to kind of exclude two as well. So how do you exclude two? At x equals two. So again, f of x equals 2 can be defined as f of x equals 2 minus, so this is say suppose this is 1 and this is 2, minus anything that is left of this, like this. So basically what we are trying to do is exactly take this range, right? That is why it's just that. This is the concept of it. And anything within, like, just within this range and excluding everything that is in this range. So that is why it's basically like that. And how do you define this? OK, that that's great that we have found out the mathematical interpretation, but how do you define it? Fx of x at 2. So fx 
at two, that specific two point, what is it? So what that is basically, so if you evaluate these guys out, you'll find out that this is fx of two minus minus fx of one minus. So I, I mean, maybe, uh, yeah, if you, if you, if you expand this expression, this is basically going to be canceling this and this out. So again, this is going to be a positive part. So fx of two minus minus fx of one minus. So two minus means everything beyond this value. Everything beyond this value is basically. Let's see how, how much is that though. This is OK, this is 1.8 though. So everything that is two and beyond. So just this guy. So anything that is out here that is going to be four by eight because this is one by eight and this is three by eight. So this is four by eight. And one minus means everything that is here. That's one by eight though. So one by eight minus. So sorry, four by eight minus one by eight, whatever the value comes out to be that three by eight. So you can see that um, if you if you do this problem, you can actually find out that the concept of excluding or including a line. That is why you also might be finding me drawing diagrams sometimes if I give you problems like that, that um, I have a diagram and I keep this circle to be hollow. Again, I include this one and keep the next circle to be hollow. Again, I include. Again, I include this point. Oh, that's that's a bad start to the problem. I'll do it again. OK, so let me see. So. Again, maybe I excluded that point. I included this point. You'll find me darkening that and then going on and excluding this point and then including that point again and then going on like that. So that's the basic math behind that though. But um, chances of you getting these problems are a little bit rare because uh, the practice time that you have is very low. But I'm not saying that this might not appear in the exam. Just for your practice sake and your understanding sake, this problem is important though. So uh, with that, I think we are good to go with exam material one. But again, just to reiterate, if you have any problems with any of these um, homework problems, or so just let's take a quick look at the homework problem. You'll find out that most of the problems we have covered. So this is the page request kind of problem. This is obviously a poison because it's mentioned. Then going down, you have the uh, PMF problem that is CK squared. You have to find out the value of C. Uh, this is a new problem that we have because problem four I have solved. So problem three I have kind of left it on your own. Uh, here as well, we have distributions and we have to plot this particular distribution and find out, OK, what is X equals to minus one? What is X less than minus one? Is it a continuous random variable or is it a discrete random variable? If it's continuous, then at specific points you have no values, zero values. But if it's discrete, you do have values because at that specific point of time, if a value is defined, then you basically take the left of the value. If it is a con if it's like instead of minus one, you have minus one point one one. You just take the left of that value. But then if it's um, exactly that value, you have to have some something defined at that specific point of time or not. Uh, so you actually you could work out this problem. Uh, this is a good practice problem for you. And again, the solutions will be available for you tomorrow, so you can actually practice from the solutions as well. Uh, problem number four we have done in the class right now. Problem number five as well we have done in the class right now. Problem number six is basically uh, find out the PDA for CDF of a continuous range. If you have to understand these type of problems, you have it in your. Um, wait, hang on. You kind of have it in your uh, slides. I'm sorry, I was just um, getting a ping from somebody. Sorry about that. Uh, you have it in your exam slides, uh, exam prep slides, and this is again a uh, sort of problems which um, which deals with very large n and very small probability. You could do it with any type of distribution, but uh, check check for what you want to use with these type of um, communication channels. Okay, modern communication zeros and ones. Um, 
This is again another type of uh, find the probability that the receiver makes a wrong decision. This might be a binary problem, so it's uh, binary means binomial, so binomial distribution could be important here or not. Just try to study the, the entire problem and see if binomial is something that you would go for. And then problem number nine is basically a mixed random variable. Um, let me see, let me see. The problem transmits over. Yeah, I think, yeah, you can actually probably attempt number eight, but, but the solutions will be available for you. But number nine is basically a mixed random variable. This problem has come a lot of times in our exams uh, just because of the concepts. You know, if you understand the concept of continuity and discrete randomness, you would be able to solve this problem, though. So again, the solutions will be available for you tomorrow, and I hope this will help you prepare for the exams really well. Again, I am available on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Thursday is your, unfortunately your exam. I will be available on Thursday morning, but very sparsely because I have to prepare for the exam. I have to you know, take the printouts and stuff like that. I will provide you the instructions for the exam on how you, uh, you should have your own calculators and stuff like that just before the exam day, so you don't have to worry about those uh, metrics as well. Again, just to reiterate myself, the slides will be available out here under the assignments. You don't have to do those assignments. It's just for your information. The solution two is up. Solution three will be up tomorrow. Please practice, and I'm pretty sure if you practice, you are going to do very well. Uh, if there are any additional materials that is supposed to be included, I will be uploading them latest by tomorrow. Uh, just let me have a conversation with Dr. D. And um, that's it for today. So if you are uh, practicing, let me know. Uh, I will always be available in either HKN room or in H142. Um, that's my lab. So best of luck, everybody. Take care.